my bad. Okay, let's start that over. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Women Who Code San Diego. And today we're going to talk about big O strings and arrays, part two. Okay, so before we get started on that, I do want to first talk about technical interviews um, in case you are new to the technical interview sort of thing. Um, so tech interviews can be quite uh, intimidating for a lot of people. Um, but really, in my opinion, they don't need to be um, because really the tech interview, it's just a chance for the company to get a sense of three things. First, how good are you at solving the algorithm? How good are at you are making that algorithm efficient? And what are you like to work with? Like, what are your communication skills like? What do you take hints? Do you, um, do you talk out your thought process, et cetera? And so I know it can get a little bit uh, intimidating if you're not used to them, but I think with practice, it becomes a lot less um, frightening and it just becomes more of a mental exercise that you're doing with someone else. And so with this series, um, this interview prep series, we're here to make the technical interview experience a lot less um, frightening and nerve wracking for you and to be a little bit more comfortable. So every first and third Saturday, um, until I figure out when I'm not gonna do them anymore, <laughs> or at least the lecture part, we always do them every third Saturdays to practice. Um, but every first Saturday, um, I will be doing the lecture portion where I will teach you about a concept um, and then you will practice it. And then on the third Saturday, you're gonna come back and practice it again. So, um, last time that we were here, we had our part one of this particular unit, which is big O strings and arrays. And we covered quite a lot of material. Um, out of curiosity, how many people were here last time for the first part of the big O strings and arrays? Go ahead and drop in the chat if you were. a response here. Okay, perfect. <laughs> At least one person here. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can test a little bit of your knowledge from last time. Put you on the spot, Grace. <laughs> Let's see, anyone else? Um, okay, cool. Um, okay, so CPOP. Does, does anyone remember what the C stands for in CPOP? Has anyone been to any of these before? If not, then I'm just gonna go ahead and keep going. <laughs> Let's see. Perfect, yes. So CPOP is our, um, I guess our little device that we use for, for approaching a technical interview challenge, right? So you never just wanna solve the challenge because um, at worst, you can solve the wrong problem, or you can realize at the end that your algorithm is just not really what's going to work. Um, so what you wanna do is take time to think of an approach that is going to, or go through the principles, and that's going to help you come up with your um, best algorithm. Or at the very least, it will help you get an algorithm down and communicate where you can optimize it. Okay, so C. <laughs> Yes, it is a corgi. <laughs> so C is, yes, clarifying the question. So when, when you get the question, um, you want to spend some time understanding what that question is. Um, say, hey, okay, um, so you want me to reverse a string, right? Okay, so will, is it the case that I will always get a string? Could I get an incorrect input? Okay. Um, if it's an empty string, what do you want me to return? Like any sort of questions that you have, that's the point for you to ask. And E, I think someone already explained examples. You want to work on your own concrete examples. So the interviewer um, will typically give you um, an example or two to work through, but you want to work on your own examples at, as well. Um, you want to work on examples that will um, break your code. <laughs> so the the outliers, you know, the ones that are kind of unlike the rest of the input, like the ha the, the unhappy input. Um, and you want to test out examples that are just regular happy inputs, like, hey, how should this, um, 
how should my code, how should my algorithm behave? And what that will do for um, a couple of things. First, it will help you understand the question better to make, once you work through an example on your own, you can see, okay, I, I can get what this question is asking. But also it will help you when you're evaluating your code, you can look through your examples and you can compare it to the expected output that you should have gotten from your examples. So if, you're, if you go through your and evaluate your code and it's not matching with what you had said earlier, then you probably need to go through your algorithm and take a look at what's going on there. So B, I think someone already know, um, put there, brute force. Um, yes, that's exactly it. So <laughs> if you can't think of anything to do, just go ahead and put down the brute force solution. Um, at, at best, it's a chance for you to just optimize. Um, so you can put down your brute force solution and say, okay, I know this is ON squared runtime, but can I get it in one pass? Okay, can I do a little less space complexity? Um, at worst, you have something down, right? Because it's better to have something than nothing at all. But it does, by putting the brute force solution down, it does give you a chance to ask those questions like, okay, how can I optimize this? Especially if you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, it, it gives you a starting point to optimize and get to the most optimal solution. Okay, oh, does anyone remember? Oh my gosh, you're so good. <laughs> Someone put O down. Thinking out loud. Um, so you never want to be completely silent in these interviews, right? Because remember when I said that this is a chance for you to communicate and show what you'd be like as a coworker, right? So this is an opportunity for you to explain your thought process, say, hey, um, okay, this is my algorithm. It's a brute force algorithm. Clearly it's Owen spur time complexity. I'm thinking about doing this or the questions I'm asking is this. And so with that, um, A, it helps the interviewers see what you're like and what your thought process is. But also B, if you're stuck, they have somewhere, um, they know where they can help you. They can see like, oh, okay, this is where this person is getting stuck. I can see that their, their framework of thinking of this problem is a little bit off. Let me just throw in this one little hint and that's gonna help them get back to the right course. Okay, P. Let's see, you guys are so good. Oh, okay. I don't see you have the P. <laughs> That's okay. Um, P is, oh, wait, did you throw it in? <laughs> okay, you're very close. Um, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Diana. It's apply patterns. <laughs> Um, so, you know, throughout the ser these series where I talk about data structures and I talk about patterns, it's going to give you a toolbox where you have all these different techniques that you can think about to solve the problem. So, you know, literally when I'm approaching a problem, I just, I just open up my, you know, proverbial toolbox and I just keep throwing, you know, at it just to think, okay, would this work, would this work, would this work? Like, okay, this is a problem. Can I use two pointers or eh, probably not. Um, is this a DP problem? No, is this greedy? No, is this something I can use a stack with? Can I, should I use, what sort of data structure should I use here? Um, is there any sort of patterns? And then that's going to help you figure out how to um, parse through your data. Um, so first think of the data structures and any patterns um, and not just the techniques that we have in our toolbox, but as you keep practicing and doing more and more problems, you're going to start recognizing patterns as well. And you can think, oh, this is sort of like this one problem that I did like, you know, back in 82, no, I'm kidding. But <laughs> it's like, this, this reminds me of a problem that I did. And I can probably use the same technique that I used to solve that problem, but just a little bit of a twist. So if you didn't remember that, that's okay. Clarify the question, work on concrete examples, design a brute force solution, think out loud and apply patterns. So those are our tech interview principles. And when you are solving the problem, be sure to, instead of just going at the problem, slow down, work yourself through these, um, and that's going to help you get to the most optimal solution. Okay, so 
more recap. Can anyone tell me what is an example of a great runtime? Drop it in the chat. Perfect, I see one. I'm thinking of another one too, but yes, constant time. If you can do anything in constant time, good for you. Oh, ON is a decent time. I'm thinking of something a little bit better than linear or ON. Yes, Maria, O log N. So O1 or constant time and O log N, very good um, run times. Linear is also a really decent run time too. Um, any examples of really bad run times? Where you're like, hey, we got to stop <laughs> and turn this car around. Yes, exponential, N by N. Um, exponential, N by N, N factorial, like these are, which honestly, I, I learned that N factorial is a bad runtime. I've personally never seen an N factorial runtime. So if anyone knows, let me know. Um, <laughs> but yes, these are all examples of runtimes um, that are very, very bad. Um, and you should probably stop what you're doing and think of something better. Oh, for permutations. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I'll have to look at that later. Okay, cool. Um, and if you didn't know, um, or if this is new to you, or if you just want a refresher, this is a um, a chart of a com of different complexities. So as you can see, n factorial, exponential, polynomial is here too. So yeah, polynomial is pretty bad. Um, sometimes when you're doing something like a grid, um, or like if you've got if you have like sort of like a matrix, and you have to go iterate through the rows and iterate through the column. Sometimes it's to be unavoided. <laughs> but um, if you can figure out a way to do it faster, definitely do that. Um, o n log n, eh, fair. So it says bad here, but sometimes o n log n is just kind of like how it is, right? So like something that we learned, I believe in the last class is that sorting algorithms are typically o n log n. So like if you're doing merge sort, if you're doing quick sort, they're gonna be O N log N. And sometimes you just have to sort your data. So eh, I'd say it's okay. And then you've got O N O log N and O N, which is you know great and amazing. Cool, 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 cool. So let's get started into the meat of this topic. And I'm actually going to time myself. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, two-dimensional arrays. So 2D arrays are very common in tech interviews. Uh, and they're also called graph or matrix or grid problems. Now, okay, so I call them interchangeably with graph problems. Technically, they're a subset of graph problems because it's still an array. You're not truly using a graph. But anytime that you're, you're dealing with nodes that have a relationship to each other, they're essentially graph problems. Okay, so 2D arrays are arrays within arrays. So um, you've got your rows. So let's see, I think you can see my cursor. So when you, get an, when you get a 2D array, it's going to look like this, right? So it's going to be one huge array and then a bunch of little arrays in between. And so these little mini arrays in between, these are your rows. And then within the arrays are your columns. And so if you put them, if you stack the array vertically, and indeed when I'm like getting a 2D array, I like to actually stack them so I can visually think of it as, you know, a grid. And this is what it looks like. So if you, you've got your, your 20 here, um, it is on row 0, 1, 2. And actually, sorry, that's a header. 0, 1, so it's row 1. And then it's column. Zero one, so it's one by one, or one comma one. Um, this is a five by four matrix, um, and so the number of rows in a grid is going to be the length of the grid, and the number of columns in a grid is going to be the length 
of one of the rows. I usually say the first row um, because there's always going to be at least one in a 2D array. So it's going to be the length of the first one. OK, so cheat codes. Um, so when you're doing a 2D array, you're basically going to be traversing at some point. And the most important thing to remember is where you are. Um, I personally just memorize it because it's just easier to just memorize it and have it in your brain. Um, but the most important things that you want to remember is up, <laughs> down, left, right. Um, and it's easier to memorize because you don't want to like, when you're in an interview, you don't want to like spend time thinking like, oh wait, where's up and where's down and where's right? Like you don't, you don't have time to be confused about something like that. So in my opinion, it's just easier to just memorize. Okay, to go left is call minus one, but you stay the same row. To go right is call plus one, um, but you stay the same row. And when you look at the array, it makes sense, um, but try not to let be confused um, and just, just memorize. Um, also, when you're looking at a grid, um, the row is going to be the first value and the column is going to be the second value. And that's what's going to be, or the second element. And that's what's going to give you your value. Um, I just remember ro like roll call. So I think row call, row call, like roll call. So that's where the row is. The row comes first, call comes second. Um, if you have to deal with diagonals, um, that's fine. It's just row minus one, call minus one if you're going up left, um, and row minus one, row plus one if you're going up right, et cetera. Um, I don't memorize those. I just I just have this <laughs> memorized, and then I figure out with diagonals, just because in general, I haven't had to deal with diagonals. People usually want up, down, left, right, so I just do that accordingly. Okay. Um, so in many 2D array problems, you're going to be finding something, you're going to try to find something, or you're going to try to traverse something. Um, so this could be like a specific value. Um, maybe you're trying to find the shortest distance. Um, maybe you're trying to find all of the elements that match this um, specific value, whatever it is. And when you're traversing a 2D array, there are two main strategies to solve this. One, you've got breadth first search, and two, you've got depth first search. So what does that mean? So breadth first search is, um, I like to think of Julie Andrews and the sound of music, like arms out wide, <laughs> because what it's a very thorough way for finding a value within a 2D array. And what that means is, you're going to, when you're searching, you're going to search wide. You're going to go as wide as you can and hit everything you can um, until you find that specific value. Um, so for example, I don't know if you remember like a few years back where everyone was obsessed with like six degrees of separation. Like, oh, I'm six degrees of separation from this person, I'm six degrees. I think it started with Kevin Bacon. So the way that breath first search works is the same way that six degrees of separation works. So you're a person, right? So say you're this person down here and you're like, hey, you have only two friends in the world. And you're like, hey, do you know who Kevin Bacon is? And you ask your friend to the left, like, hey, do you know who Kevin Bacon is? And you ask your friend to the right, hey, do you know who Kevin Bacon is? And they're like, no, I don't know who that is, but I can ask our two friends. So you, so the person to the left asks their two friends, like, hey, do you know who Kevin Bacon is? Hey, do you know who Kevin Bacon is? And then everyone keeps asking their, their, their neighbors, their, their friends, until finally you reach a node or a person and you're like, hey, do you know who Kevin Bacon is? And that final node says, not only do I know who Kevin Bacon is, but I am Kevin Bacon. And that's sort of how breath verse search works. It goes node by node or level by level. Um, also, it's really great if you're looking for the shortest path. Um, it's really great for doing that. Okay, so this is also another illustration of how breath first search works. So you start at one node and then you go out wide um, until you reach that final node. 
And here is some pseudocode for how you would do breath first search in a graph or a 2D array. So you're gonna create a queue and then you're going to add the starting node to the queue. And then while that queue has nodes, you're going to dequeue from that queue or you're gonna remove from the first of the queue. If the node has not been visited, then you're going to visit the node. Um, and then for each of its neighbors that are not visited, um, you're going to add it to the queue. And that's how you're going to process one by one. Now, what do I mean when I say visited? Um, you don't, the thing with queues is if you keep adding the same nodes back and back over and over into the queue, you're never going to end and you're never going to reach a point where you stop traversing. It's just gonna go on to infinity. So what you're going to do is visit is a technique that you can use to let yourself know that I've already like asked this, hey, like I've already asked this person, do you know Kevin Bacon? You don't wanna ask the, the, a friend eight times, like, do you know Kevin Bacon? Cause they're gonna be like, dude, like stop asking me. I already told you, I don't know Kevin Bacon. So you wanna keep track of all the people you've asked so that you don't ask the same person over and over. And that's the same thing with these nodes. You wanna keep um, some sort, you wanna use some sort of technique, whether you wanna put it in a set or whether you wanna mark the node um, to let you know, okay, I've already asked this person, do you know, do you know what that node is or are, do you have a path to that node? Um, and, you, and at some point you're going to stop. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, let's actually show you an illustration. So I'm gonna show you a little illustration of how this works. Whoops. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna show you a little illustration of how breath first search works. So we're gonna start at node number nine and we're going to ask the question, do you have a path to one? And we're going to use breath for search to find that answer out. Does nine have a path to one? And we're going to do it using breath for search. So first we're gonna start by making a queue and we're going to, I don't have a lot of room on this page, so the way I'm going to mark something as um, visited is I'm going to mark it by changing it to the letter X or something like that, yeah. Um, and remember the most important things when traversing a 2D array, aside from like how to do breath first search or death first search is up, left, down, right. So um, we're gonna do, we're gonna go up first, right, down, and then left. Okay, so actually I'm gonna move this a little bit down. So we're gonna add the starting node to the queue. So we're gonna add nine to the queue. And while the queue has nodes, it does have nodes, we're going to dequeue. Okay, cool. Is it visited? Uh, no, it is not visited. So we're going to visit it by marking it with an X. Oh, wow, that does nothing. Okay, <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to add its neighbors to the queue. So up is nothing, right is eight. So we're going to add eight to the queue. Um, and then six is there as well. And they're both not visited either. So we're gonna add them and left is nothing. Okay, cool. So now we're done with that. Now we're going to dequeue. Um, is eight visited? Nope. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead. And is it our node that we're looking for? Nope. Okay. So let's go ahead and add its neighbors to the queue. So up is nothing. Right is seven. So let's go ahead and add that to the queue. Uh, down is five. So let's add it to the queue. Left is nine, but it's visited. So we're going to not do that. Oh, and I forgot to visit this. So whoopsies. Okay, cool. Now we're done with that. So now we have six and we're, while the node has Q or while the queue has nodes, it does have nodes. So we're gonna DQ. And is six visited? Nope. Okay, so let's go ahead and visit it. 
Is it our node? Nope. Okay. So let's go ahead and add its neighbors to the queue. Up is visited, right is five. So let's go ahead and add five. Um, down is three. So let's add three. Left is nothing. And I did say up is visited, right? I believe so. Okay. So we're done. While the queue has nodes, it does. So we're going to DQ. Is seven visited? Nope. Okay, let's go ahead and visit it. And then let's add its neighbors to the queue. So up is nothing, right is nothing, down is four, left is visited. Okay, so we're done. Oh, and it's not the node that we're looking for. <laughs> Be worried. That wasn't clear. Okay. Is five visited? No. So let's go ahead and visit it. And let's go ahead and add its neighbors to the queue. So we're going to look up. That's visited, so we don't add it. Four is not visited, so we add it. Two is not visited, so we add it. And left is visited, so we don't add it. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and DQ. Is five visited? Yeah, it is. So let's keep going. Is three visited? Nope. OK, let's go ahead and add it or visit it. And is it our node? Nope. OK, let's go ahead and add its neighbors to the queue. So up is visited. Right is not visited. Down is nothing. Left is nothing. OK, so we're done. While the node has queues, or while the queue has nodes, <laughs> we're going to dequeue. So is four visited? Nope. So let's go ahead and visit it. And let's go ahead and add its neighbors to the queue. Is up, or up is visited, left is visited, down is one, and right is nothing. So we're good. I actually did that out of order, but whatevs. Okay, four, is that visited? It is. All right, let's get out of here. Two, is that visited? Nope. So let's go ahead and look at its, oh, and is this the node that we're looking for? Nope. So let's go ahead and add its neighbors. Up is visited, left is visited, right is not visited, uh, down is nothing. So let's keep going. Oh, and we just visited that. Okay. Is that visited? Yep. Let's keep going. One, is that visited? Nope. Um, is it the node that we're looking for? Yes. Okay, perfect. We can return that yes, we have indeed, we do have a path from nine to one. And that is how breath first search works. Very thorough. Okay, let's take a look at the chat. Ah, yeah, so I did, I did say, oh, up, down. Okay, gotcha. So I, <laughs> I did say up, down, left, right. Um, it's not the specific order that matters. It's that you remember how to get there, right? So you can go up, down, left, right. You can go up, left, down, whatever, but you just need to know how to get there. So in this visual example, I, I didn't really give you um, an opportunity to um, calculate how to do this, but when we go to, oops. So remember that these are rows and that these are columns. So when you go to the right, you're going, you're staying in the same row and you're going call plus one. When you're going to the left, you're staying in the same row, but you're doing call minus one. When you're going up, you're doing row minus one and then call. And then when you're going down, you're doing row plus one and then call. So when I say, <laughs> sorry for being confusing. When I say the most important things to remember is up, right, down, left. What I'm actually saying is like, you need to remember how to get there. Um, and you need to remember what is in and out of bounds. So um, when, you, when you're doing row minus one, if row minus one is negative one, then you need to stop what you're doing and not try to go there. Um, if call plus one is you know, outside of the bounds of that array, then you need to stop what you're doing and make sure you don't visit that node. Sorry if that, that wasn't clear. 
Okay, so let's keep going. There we go. All right. So now we're going to continue on to depth first search. So depth first search, okay, so breadth first search and depth first search, remember they're just two ways to do the same thing, like traversing the array. Sometimes a depth first search um, algorithm makes sense, and sometimes a breadth first search algorithm makes more sense. And it's just going to be through practice that you're going to be able to understand these things. So depth first search, as the name suggests, this method goes very deep instead of wide. So remember that breath first search was like, ah, arms out. Um, instead, you're going deep, like a little like a little snake here. You're going as deep as, as you can possibly go before you find that one. And if you can't find it, then you go back and you go deep again. Um, so yes, you're, tra you're traveling down the rabbit hole until you reach a wall or you find the destination. So an example I like to think of is like a maze, right? So when you're looking through a maze and you're trying to find the end, you know, when you're you know doing your little like puzzle and you're trying to find the end, you're going as deep as you can possibly go in the maze until you can't anymore. And then you go back and then you go as deep as you can, like all you're trying all these different ways. And that's what depth first search is. It's basically like traveling through a maze. So, excuse me. Um, here's the pseudocode, and there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, you can do a stack, which once upon a time, I think the last time I taught this, I was like, eh, I don't like stacks. I only like recursion. Well, I finally seen the light, <laughs> and I am now a big fan of using stacks for um, depth first search because um, with recursion, it can be a little bit tricky sometimes if you're not watching out for runtime. Anywho, that's neither here nor there. Both are very equally valid ways of finding um, a target within a graph. So to traverse a graph or a 2D array using depth first search, if you're using a stack, you're going to create a stack, then you're going to add the starting node to the stack. And then while the stack has nodes, you're going to pop the stack. And if the node is not visited, then you're going to visit it. I just realized I have a typo here. You're going to visit it. And then for each neighbor that's not in visited, you're going to add it to the stack. Um, very similar to breadth first search, except that instead of using a queue, you're going to use a stack instead. So for recursion, what you're going to do is you're gonna have a helper function and you're going to send that node to the recursive function. Now in the recursive function, you're going to first check, hey, is this visited or out of bounds or null or whatever? If so, return. But if not, then visit the node and then recursively call each neighbor. Yeah, so Marina um, had a good point about um, recursion. So if you're not careful, um, recursion can really, it's not that you can't use recursion because often recursion is a great, um, a very clean way of writing your code. Um, you just have to be careful of analyzing the runtime before throwing something in recursion. Um, if you know what your recursion is doing and you look at the runtime and you see like, oh, this is, you're just traversing this. So it's only going to be ON, then you're going to be fine. But if you're doing something like calling recursion um, multiple times within a function, then that's where things get to, get to be really sketchy. Um, so in a 2D array, if you're building a recursive function, like, like a basic recursive function, at most what you're going to be doing is traveling the array. And if you have um, a technique like visited so that you're not visiting the same nodes over and over again, the worst you could do in a recursive function is visit all of the arrays once and that's it. So I'm not worried about recursion for this particular thing, but if you're building a recursive function and um, 
you can visit the same sets multiple times, or you can be solving the same problems multiple times, then that's when that's when recursion gets a little sketchy. And that's when you should really, um, you should really think about what you're doing. So recursion isn't terrible. It's just that um, if you're not thinking about what how your recursive function is behaving, it can it can get you into trouble. <laughs> um, but great question. Okay, cool. Let's keep going. Oh, I am going to illustrate what this would look like um, in a maze. Okay. So for this, we're going to start at nine and we're going to ask the question, does nine have a path to zero? Okay, so here's how it's going to go. So I'm going to mark visited because I don't have a lot of room here. I'm going to mark visited with a an X, just like we did before. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a Q. Okay, cool. So our, our algorithm <laughs> for doing um, DFS, first you add the starting node to the stack. Okay. And while the stack has nodes, it does, you're going to pop the stack. Okay. Is this visited? Nope. Okay. We're going to go ahead and visit it. And then we're going to add each of its neighbors to the stack. So up is out of bounds. Um, and remember up is the row minus one, but the same column. So that is out of bounds. Right is same row, but call plus one, and that is within bounds, and it is not visited. So let's go ahead and add it to the stack. Oh, you know what? I actually want to, <laughs> I realize this is going to get us to the, the solution quicker than I thought. So I'm going to go, <laughs> just for the sake of this, I'm going to go left, down, right. So left is out of bounds. Down is um, within bounds, and that is row plus one column. So I'm going to put this eight there. And then eight is within bounds as well. We already just did that. And so I'm going to put that into the stack. Okay, cool. So while the, and I should actually make this different colors so you know what I'm doing. Okay. So while the stack has nodes, it does, I'm going to pop the stack. Okay. Is this visited? Nope. All right, I'm going to visit it then. And now I'm going to add its neighbors to the stack. So up is up is out of bounds, left is visited, down is a wall, and then right is there. So we're gonna add seven to the stack. Okay, so while the stack has nodes, it does, I'm going to pop the stack. And is it visited? Nope. Okay, let's go ahead and visit it and add its neighbors. So up, left is visited, down is here. Okay, cool. So, oh, and then right is here, darn. I'm like, I realize that I'm getting to the solution closer than I had wanted to, but we'll, we'll hopefully we'll, um, share a point here. Hopefully you will see the point. Oops, my bad. Okay, cool. While the stack has nodes, you're going to pop the stack. And this is this six, by the way. Okay. Are you visited? Nope. Let's go ahead and visit you and add your neighbors. We're going to up, left is visited, down is a wall, right is not visited. So we're going to add five to there. Okay, cool. So while the queue has nodes, or while the stack has nodes, we're going to pop the stack. And let's see, up is nothing, left is visited, down, oh, and we're also going to visit it, excuse me. Down is not visited, so we're going to add it to the stack. Okay, while the stack has nodes, it does, we're going to pop the stack. Up is visited, left is nothing, down is nothing, Right is nothing. Oh, I forgot that I visited it. So four doesn't have, it does not have a um, path to zero. Okay, that's fine. 
So we're just gonna keep going back to the stack and six is here. So we're just going to go ahead and pop and look at six now. And now we're looking at this six over here. So six is not visited. So we're going to visit it. But if you look around, up is visited, left is nothing, down is nothing, right is nothing. So it does not have a path to the last node. So that's fine. What we're going to do is just go to the stack. We're going to pop it and keep going. So eight up is visited, left is nothing, down is seven. Let's go ahead and add that. We're going to pop. Is that visited? Nope, we're going to visit it. Oops, I forgot to do that. And add its neighbors. And so as you can see, I'm gonna keep adding its neighbors. I don't wanna do every single one because I think you get the idea, but we're gonna keep adding its neighbors all the way through until we reach the final one that we're looking for. And that's when we're going to stop traversing. And that is how depth first search works. All right, so let's keep going here. Okay, so now that I've taught you a little bit about breadth first search and depth first search, we're actually going to do a practice round where you're going to practice with a problem. So I actually apologize here. This little link here is not actually the one that you're going to use. So let me give you the real link. That link, copy it, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat where your whiteboards are going to be. And really quickly, I am going to just show you what this is going to look like. So when you open this link, you're going to, we're going to break you up into different breakout rooms. And each breakout room is going to have a number. And that number is going to be what you're going to use to use your whiteboard, your, your whiteboard. So you're going to go into here and you're going to look at the problem. We're gonna talk about the problem, but you're going to go into here, you're gonna look at the problem, I'm gonna try not to show you. Um, and then you're going to use, we have a little worksheet here for you to help you sort of think about the components of your algorithm. But once you're ready to code, you're going to go into Replit and then start coding that up. So I recommend one person being the driver um, so you're going to make something like right here. You're going to create a replit. I recommend one person being the driver and writing the code like in replit and then everyone else just sort of helping them with the algorithm. But if you want all everyone to um, work on the same document and write at the same time, you can generate um, a join link and then send it to your group in the chat. And that way everyone's going to be able to work on your same code. Um, don't worry, it looks like it looks like we're all on the same chat within the break rooms. Once you go into the break room, it is only for your specific, um, that chat is only for your specific group. Um, I also have a Repit link down here for the pseudocode for breath first search and depth first search. So if you forgot, no worries. It's a lot of information at once. I, I know I just sort of spoke at you for about an hour here. Um, but if you want to remember, I have some pseudocode right here. Um, breath for search for both um, breath for search and also death for search for, for both recursion and um, stack. We're language ag agnostic, so you can use any sort of language. Um, this is just English here, so feel free to translate that into code. And with that, let's go into the problem. Okay, so. Given a map of ones and zeros, count the number of islands. So ones equals land and zeros equals water. An island is surrounded by water and is formed by connecting adjacent lands horizontally or vertically. You may assume all four edges of the grid are all surrounded by water. So saying that in just plain simple terms, you're going to get a 2D array and it's going to have a bunch of, excuse me, ones and zeros. The ones represent land and the zeros represent water. Um, anything that's on an edge is just water. And your job is to count how many islands are in that 2D array. 
So in this example here, we've got a bunch of ones here. So we've got ones here. And if you look here, they're all connected. So what you would return in this example is one because there's only one island. Um, in the second example here, you've got one island right here and it's surrounded by water. You've got one island right here and you've got another island right here. And you would output three because there are three islands. Um, diagonals don't count. So you see how this has diagonals, doesn't count. Um, land needs to be up, down, right, left um, for it to count as part of that island. Any questions before we get started? Let's see, look in the chat. Oh, can I post a link to the replet as well? So in your um, in your little breakout rooms, like your little whiteboards that you have for each group, the replet link is in there. So there's a link to replet and there's a link to the pseudocode as well. Yeah, sure. So to explain the output for the first one. So remember your job is to count how many islands there are. Um, so in this first one, when you're looking here, all of the ones are connected. This connect, this one is connected to this one right here because it's in the same column. This is all connected here. This is connected here because it's in the same column, all connected here. This is connected because it's in the same row. So this represents one island. So you would output one. And as you keep looking, there's no more islands. So no more ones. So that would be an island. Does that make sense or do you want me to um, explain further? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So with that, um, I will go ahead and break us up, or I believe Jillian will break us up. Okay, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> today, I'm going to go over the problem, or not today, but right now, I'm going to go over the problem. Um, so it looks like a lot of people were able to get to code, which is pretty great. And what I'm going to do is just share how I would approach the problem. Um, okay, cool. So remember CBOP, right? So clarify the question. We did in the beginning before we went into breakout rooms, we did clarify um, what the question was. So I'm gonna skip that. Okay, examples. So um, we were given this example and the output here is, is one. Um, so I'm going to do another input here, um, and I'm going to say like zero, one, let's see, one, zero. What's the output here? What's the expected output here? Take a look in the chat. Perfect, two, great. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to do this one. Okay, brute force, um, let's see. For the sake of time, I'm actually not going to figure out a brute force solution, but I know that I, one thing I'm gonna do is I know I want to go through and, and find all the ones, right? And so um, let's actually skip down to um, P, which is applying patterns. So I know this is a 2D array, and so I know the patterns I have for 2D arrays are depth for search or breadth for search. Um, because I'm just, because I need to traverse through all of the array to find out how many um, islands there are, I think that there's really no need for me to have a brute force because I have to, no matter what, traverse through all of the rows and all of the columns to find all of the ones. Like I can't like leave part of the the array or the 2D array out, right? So I have to go through all of them. So um, I know that I'm going to use one of those probably to, well, I know that because it's a 2D array, I'm probably gonna use BFS or DFS. 
So one thing I can do is I can iterate through all the rows and all the columns. And if I find a one, then I need to find out like what the island is, right? So maybe I can use either BFS or DFS to go through and find all of the, the ones and then mark them as visited. And so as I keep going through the rows and columns, if I find another one, then I just increase the count of the islands. Um, and if I don't find another one, then that means there's only one island. Or if there's no one at all, that's actually, let's do that as a test case here, input equals, what would my number of islands be? I'll make it like more interesting. Oh, hello. Perfect, no islands. So this is an example of like, hey, try to find things that are gonna break your code. I shouldn't assume that there's going to be an island. Um, it could be the case I, I receive um, an input without any ones. Okay, cool. So what I pretty much what my plan was um, is I'm going to, Oh, hello, what's going on with my keyboard? Hey, not sure what's going on there. I will use my laptop keyboard. So I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I don't know why, but my keyboard. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> so my plan is I'm going to iterate through Huh, this is so weird, you all. I don't know what's going on, but my keys aren't working. Okay, so I'm going to iterate through each row, and then I'm going to iterate through each column. And then if I find a one, I'm going to throw into a traversal. I'm gonna just choose BFS, because that's just easiest for me. Um, I'm going to throw into BFS, and then I'm also going to increase count of islands by one. Okay, and throw into BFS. Um, I also want to make sure that it's not visited before. Remember that whole thing with Kevin Bacon, don't ask the same thing like multiple times. Um, oh, just move the dongle closer to the keyboard and or throw. Interesting. Let's try to see. <laughs> Um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna test to see if this works. Thank you. Okay, if I find a one, increase the count of islands by one and throw into BFS. I also want to make sure that it's visited. Um, if I find a one, oh well, I'm gonna have to mark it as visited. Um, I don't want to keep a set or some sort of extra data structure just because I want to save on space complexity. So I'm gonna mark it as something that's in the input. So maybe I'm going to mark it as like a two or something like that. So find a one um, and I'm gonna say, and not visited, increase count of islands um, by one and throw into BFS. Okay. And then finally, I'm going to return the count. I think that's all I need to know. Okay, cool. So let's get this going. Um, this is Python, just a heads up. Um, so what, find islands or something like that? Um, we're going to get a grid and that is going to be, I'm typing, and we're going to get a list of integers. Um, for all of our, my Java friends, list is basically an array. Um, and what we're going to return is an integer. Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do is iterate through each row, iterate so let's just do the basics of this. Um, I'm gonna set some variables just to make this easier for me. Um, I'm gonna set land equals one. I'm gonna set water equals zero. And I'm gonna set visited as two. We're gonna set it to two, it's visited. Okay, cool. So, Okay, so I'm going to set maybe islands equals zero. And let's iterate. So for row in range len of grid, remember 
the number of rows is the length of the entire grid. And then for call in range len of grid zero, uh, remember the length of columns or the number of columns is the length of one of the rows in the grid, but I always just choose the first one because there's always going to be at least one. Okay, so what do we want to do? If we find a one that's not visited, we're going to increase the count of islands by one and throw into BFS, okay? So if the grid row call equals, if it's land, then we're going to increase count of islands. So num, oops, num islands plus equal one, and then throw it into BFS. So I don't want to make my code messy. So I'm going to make a helper. Um, so I'm going to say BFS search. And I'm going to throw in the grid. I'm going to throw in the row and the column. OK, cool. It's mad at me because I have to define what that is. So let's just go ahead and put def, BFS search, uh, grid, row, call. We'll just put pass for now. OK. And then once that's done and I'm iterating through everything, then I'm going to return the account, return num islands. Okay, cool. So that's the basic part of our code. We're going to iterate through the rows. We're going to iterate through the columns. If I find a one, I'm going to increase the number, number of islands. And then I'm going to try to find all of the rest of the island. And then once I'm done, keep going. And as I keep getting more ones and ones, I'm going to increase the count of the islands. Okay, cool. So BFS search. What is our BFS search algorithm? It's okay, I've already memorized it for you. So we're going to create a queue. Is that how you spell queue? Who knows? Create a queue. We're going to add the starting node to queue. Oops. While the queue has nodes, we're going to dequeue. And then if the node is not visited, we're going to visit the node. And then we're going to add neighbors to the queue. That's just the basic algorithm for breath first search. OK, so let's create a queue. Um, I actually like using decks instead of queues. They're double-ended queues. Um, it's just something that's a little bit more performant. Um, so don't mind. Don't mind me, <laughs> just think it's a queue, but it's just a little bit under the hood. It's just a little bit different than a regular queue. We're gonna have a section on queues where I will explain what I mean, but just for all intents and purposes, it's a queue. Okay, so create a queue. So queue equals that. And add the start node to the queue. So I'm going to add, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to add actually a tuple. So queue dot, append. I'm going to put row call. Okay. So while there, the queue has nodes, so while queue, um, if the node, oh, DQ. So node equals Q dot, oops, top left. Okay. While the node has queues, DQ. Okay. If the node is not visited, visit it. So remember, I decided for space um, reasons, I'm not going to create another, um, I'm not going to create another data structure. So I'm just going to modify the input. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, I'm going to actually parse this out and call it node row and node call. This is a Pythonism. Sorry. I'm just basically what's going to happen is the node is going to come out as a tuple. And what I'm saying is the first thing in the tuple, that's the node row. And the second thing in the tuple, that's the node call. Um, it's just a Python thing for, for Java friends. Okay, so node row, node call is q.popleft. Okay, so if grid node row node call is not visit it, then we're going to visit it. So grid, node row, node call, we're going to set it to visited. Okay, then what else are we going to do? 
we're going to add neighbors to the queue. So once again, I like my code to be very clean and nicely packaged. So I'm not gonna add all the code in here. I'm gonna make another helper. So I'm gonna say um, for neighbor in get neighbors, uh, grid uh, node row, comma node call. Um, neighbor not in, oh, if neighbor not equal visited. So I'm actually gonna parse this out. So I'm gonna call it neighbor row comma neighbor call. If grid neighbor row neighbor call is not visited, then we're gonna add it to the queue. Okay, cool. So that is just the basic breadth first search that we talked about. We're gonna go through, we're gonna go through the rows, we're gonna go through the columns. If one, we're going to go, we're gonna find all of its neighbors and we're going to change it to visited. Um, and that's it. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and it's mad at me because I didn't get this. So get neighbors, we have row call. Okay, cool. So remember the most important thing for traversing a 2D array, what to remember, up, left, right, down, et cetera. This is where that comes in. So we're going to do up, left, down, uh, right. And so what we wanna do is we wanna find everything that's connected, but we still wanna be within bounds, right? So we're going to do within this, we're going to do a check to make sure that we're gonna do a check to make sure that our neighbors are within bounds. So let's start off by, um, I like to set min row, min call, max call, cause it's like things like these, I, I don't like magic numbers and I don't like messy things. <laughs> I try to keep my code as close to English as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and set my min row, even though I know it's zero, um, I'm gonna set the min row and min call to zero. Um, and then I'm gonna set the max row and the max, oops, max call. So remember the max row is the length or the length of the row or how many, <laughs> the number of rows is the length of the grid and the number of columns is the length of one of the rows in the grid. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so how do we go up? So up is, remember, it's going to be row minus one, but the same column. Left is the same row, but call minus one. Down is row plus one, but the same column and right is row, but the column plus one. So we wanna check, oh, and I wanna set my neighbors. So I'm gonna set an array of neighbors. Okay, so let's go up. So if row minus one is greater than or equal to min call, then let's add up to neighbors. So neighbors.append um, row minus one call, okay? If call minus one is less than or equal to max call, then let's go ahead and add left to the neighbors. Oops, row call. Wait, yeah, that's left, right? Less, that is not, that is right. <laughs> okay, greater than, <laughs> greater than or equal to min call, excuse me. Gotta love live coding. Um, okay, so if call minus one is greater than or equal to min call, then we're going to add left to the neighbors array. Also feel free to shout out if you see me like terribly forgetting something because I do that all the time. Okay, if row plus one, this is down, is less than or equal to 
max row, then add it to the set of neighbors. Row plus one, call. Okay. And then finally, if who is this call plus one, we're going right, is less than or equal to max call, we're going to add it to the neighbors. Row call plus one. And then we're going to return return neighbors. Okay, cool. So just recapping here, we're going to iterate through all the rows. We're gonna iterate through all the columns. If we find a one, we're going to increase the count of our islands and we're gonna find everywhere where, um, where there's a one. So BFS, what's going to do is, oh, I just realized something I forgot. So not only do, if it's not visited, do we want to take a look at the neighbor, but we want to make sure that the neighbor is a land, right? Because there's land and there's water. We don't want to go through all the water and modify it and make it visited. So I'm going to, hmm, I'm going to say if grid neighbor is not visited and grid neighbor row, and let's see. Whoops, hello, where did I go? Neighbor call is land. Because if it's water, we don't care about it. Then append it to the queue. Okay, let's take a look here. Up needs to be compared to min row. I think so too. Let's take a look. If row minus one, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you are absolutely correct. <laughs> Glad to see you all are paying attention and awake because I am not. <laughs> okay, cool. So we want to make sure that is, okay. So I know that we are over time really quickly. I'm going to just show you what it would look like to evaluate this. Let's start off with something really short. So, like you want to see what your code is doing, right? I know it's fun to just throw it into leak code and just like keep coding against the checks. Don't do that. Um, be a <laughs> be a very diligent engineer. You want to evaluate your code and see how it performs. Okay, so remember what was our output here? I believe it was two. So let's take a look here. Um, num islands equals zero. So num islands is zero. And we're going to iterate through each row and we're going to iterate through each column. If grid row is LAN, we're going to increase it by one. Okay, so let's iterate through each row and let's iterate through each column. Oh, it is one. So we're going to place that into one. And so what are we going to do afterwards? We're going to BF search it, BFS search it. So let's BFS search it. So we're going to BFS search. Was this zero, one? Okay. So what do we do for zero one? We're gonna create a queue and then we're going to, so let me just create a queue, a fake hypothetical queue. And we're going to add it to the queue, okay? We're going to pop or we're going to dequeue and parse it. So node row equals zero and node call equals zero. And if the if that is visited, we're going, if it's not visited, we're looking, it's not because it's a one, we're going to visit it. So we're going to set it to two. For neighbor row in get neighbors, okay, so let's go ahead and call get neighbors. Uh, with zero comma one. Okay, so what's get neighbors doing? It's establishing all of that. Okay, so up. Uh, is up within bounds? Uh, no. Is left within bounds? It is. So we're going to add, we're going to add, what is this, zero, zero? Okay. Is down within bounds? It is. So we're going to add, what is this, one, zero? Is right within bounds? It's not. Okay, so these are your neighbors. We're going to 
look here, what do we do? If grid neighbor is not visited, okay, this is not visited and this is not visited and it's land, neither of them are land, okay? So we're not going to append. So we're just gonna keep going. Um, while the queue has nodes, wait, where is my queue? Where's my fake queue? Oh, it's here. And we already queued that. So while the queue has nodes, it doesn't. Okay, cool. So we're just gonna keep going back. So we're iterating through the row, iterating through each column. So now we're, we're at the last point in the column. So now we're gonna go to a new row. And what do you know? We've got ourselves another one. So what do we do? We're going to increase the num islands by one and throw into BFF search. So num islands is now two. And we're gonna do BFF search. And so we're gonna add the starting node to the queue. So we've got one comma zero. Let's get this, Ooh, get this out of here. Okay. So what this, does this do? So it creates a queue, appends it to the queue. While queue, we do have a queue. So let's go ahead and dequeue it. So node row is one and node call is zero. If node is not visited, are you visited? Nope, it's a one. So let's visit it. So we're gonna change this to a two. Okay, cool. So for neighbor row and get neighbors. Okay, so let's go to get neighbors and let's throw, this is not, this is one zero, excuse me. So now we're gonna do get neighbors with one zero. Okay, let's see what it's doing. Is min is up within bounds? It is within bounds. So let's add neighbors equals zero, zero. Is left within bounds? No, it's not. Is down within bounds? No, it's not. Is right within bounds? It totally is. So let's add one, one. Okay, so that's our neighbors. Now, for each neighbor, if neither of them are visited, and their land, neither of them are land, so we're not going to append. So we're done. So we're gonna go ahead and keep iterating. So we were here and now we we're here and now we're done. Okay, so we're done. Now we're going to return num islands, which we set as two. And is our num islands two? It totally is. So, so far it's working. Um, in a technical interview, I would do this with all of them. Uh, but we don't have the time today because I'm already over. <laughs> so I'm going to say I trust this. <laughs> but um, in a technical interview, you would go through all of the output. You would actually run the code. Uh, let's see. Let's just run it. I'm sorry. Let's just run it. Let's see if it's working. Let's print. Um, what did I call this? Find islands. Find islands. And then let's create a grid equals this, right? Is that valid? I hope so. And let's just make sure that it's working. Watch, it's like not, and it's like, you messed up somewhere. <laughs> okay, ah, uh, import deck, no, what? This is an API problem from collections, import deck. Are you kidding me? Did I, let's see, num islands, num plus one. Okay, I'm gonna have to figure out what I did here. Okay, I'm trying to think of what I did. I see things in the chat, change my twos to ones. What does that mean in the input? Oh, did I not? Well, no, I did. Grid node equals visited. Let's see, plus or minus one equals land. Hmm, let me say print, print true. <laughs> hmm, print land. Do you, are you taking my variables? Okay, we're gonna have to figure this out. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's in the in the input that you're sending to your program. The grid that you copy pasted oh. had the twos in it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> How embarrassing. 
<laughs> okay. I see what you're saying, John, now. I'm like, what? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, look, it's working. <laughs> okay, always make sure you're paying attention. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share. Um, thank you so much for attending. Um, really quickly, oops, I thought I was doing something else here. Really quickly, before I let y'all go, hmm, I'm not sure why it's not pulling up, but I guess I will continue with this one. Sorry, everyone. So before I let you all go, I do want to, um, Okay. I do want to talk to you about some resources, which I think are very important. I'm just going to leave them up on the slide. Um, so study, study, study. <laughs> There's so many of these problems in leak code. Um, another one is PRAMP. Um, it's a mock interview session um, that's free. I really recommend it. Um, there's a whole bunch of whiteboarding videos. Um, I will go ahead and link these slides in the discussion notes so that you can go through and practice it at will. But thank you so much for coming. Practice, practice, practice. Um, and we're going to keep doing these every first and third Saturdays. So, and I will pass it off to Jillian who will tell you about more events happening with Women Who Code.